We continue our series called Healthy Church. What does healthy church look like? What do you look like when you're healthy? And today we're going to be in the fourth chapter looking at this topic of deceit. There's all kinds of deceit in 1 Timothy as the young pastor is having to fight against a false doctrine. And he starts this way, the Apostle Paul says, The Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, you ask yourself, all right, what are these? Because I certainly don't want to believe in them. What is a doctrine of a demon? What are these deceitful ideas? Well, fortunately, we're not left in the dark. Uh, We are told what these deceitful doctrines are. And they have to do with rejecting the physical. You remember there was an early movement called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism essentially elevated the spiritual and denigrated the physical. You remember that they would say things like Jesus would never come in the flesh. He would never come as a physical person because that would be to insult God. So they were pushing down the physical and elevating the spiritual. And so this is part of the deceit that is surrounding this church in Ephesus as Paul is trying to warn the young pastor, watch out for this movement. And in fact, you're going to find in just a minute that they're saying things like, make sure that you don't get married. Marriage is sinful because marriage involves physical intimacy. And watch out for certain foods because you're going to be more holy if you abstain from certain foods. So I want you to see that this is an, it's an early form of legalism. It is an early legalism that has penetrated this church and it is, uh, it is actually causing all kinds of divisions and rifts in the congregation. Imagine today uh, if we were told that a select diet is needed. Well, actually, you don't have to imagine, do you? Because today in the church, there are people advocating for a Daniel fast from the Old Testament to be more spiritual. There are people telling us to delve into Judaism to make our Christianity more real. Uh, There are people that forbid marriage today. The Catholic Church, for example, forbids marriage for some who are in leadership, right? Why is that? So that they can be more spiritual and therefore more qualified, supposedly, to lead. And so these beliefs, these distractions, they're very fine-sounding and they're tantalizing, but they're not real spirituality. So isn't it interesting that the same deceptions that are around today about you trying to mistreat your body and you trying to discipline your body to gain favor with God, uh, that sort of thing was around 2,000 years ago. It's been a distraction for a long, long time. And so if you go back to the Garden of Eden, you actually see the first... uh, utterances of deceit. I mean, the first time that the enemy has a doctrine of demons, it occurs in the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? That's a doctrine of demons. Uh, Why is that? Well, when you look at it, you see Satan basically teaching that uh, God is holding out. God is holding out on them and they could have it better and if they would just follow this knowledge of good and evil then they would get more good they would get gooder they would get better and they would avoid evil and do good and they would improve themselves right and so this doctrine of demons was first found in the garden of eden and you say well all right then what do i do about it Uh, what do i do Well, it's much like a banker might tell you or a bank teller. You get to know the real thing, and then the counterfeit really sticks out. So uh, Paul is going to tell us what the real thing looks like. He's going to tell us, hey, food, give thanks for it. Marriage, give thanks for it. 
Give thanks for what we have. God created the physical. It's not a competition between the physical and the spiritual. And a lot of times religion sort of does that. Have you noticed that religion creates a a competition between the physical and the spiritual? Let me give you some examples. If you just had enough faith, you wouldn't need medicine. Oh, that's a competition between the spiritual and the physical. If you were just more spiritual, you wouldn't need physical help. You see that? And furthermore, if you just believed in the health wealth gospel, you would never get sick to begin with. It's mind over matter, spiritual over physical. Now, in the scriptures, people were healed, weren't they? But it was instant, and it was permanent, and it was obvious, and God used someone in that moment. It was not go home and try to believe harder. It was not go home and do the mental gymnastics of mind over matter. It was one moment you're not healed, the next moment God intervenes, and then you are healed, and it's permanent, and it's real, and it's over, and it's done. And it's obvious. That's biblical healing. That's a biblical miracle. But this idea that you need to activate your faith more and uh, your faith is, is not enough right now and if you would just do more and be more then finally you would go through the mental gymnastics of being healed. Uh, That is nowhere to be found in the scripture. So we see for 2,000 years there's this competition between the physical and the spiritual and are we forgetting? Are we forgetting that God created the physical? I mean, we're meant to be compatible. We're body, soul, and spirit, and there's no conflict there. And so in this chapter, we're going to be invited in to give thanks for our bodies, to give thanks for our physicality. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, wow, this is strong language, you hypocrites, you liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. What does this mean? It means, are you practicing what you preach? And apparently, the answer is no for a lot of these deceivers. They're forbidding marriage, but maybe they're already married. They're forbidding foods, but they're eating them in secret. They're liars. And I guess you say, well, how do we apply this today? Are there liars today? Not in ministry. Yeah, there are liars today. And the way that we avoid lying is to not preach law. Because Romans says, you who preach law, do you obey the law? You who preach, thou shalt not steal, do you steal? You who preach, thou shalt not lie, do you lie? In other words, Romans sets everybody up for hypocrisy. If you're going to teach the law, you've already got egg on your face. The moment you delve into Moses, little appetizer of Moses to flick it at people in the church. Little dab will do you. One ounce of law and you're a hypocrite because once you take one little bit, it's 613 laws staring you in the face saying you're a liar and you're a hypocrite and you are not practicing what you preach. The law is an all or nothing proposition. It's not multiple choice. It's not choose your own adventure. It's not uh, tailor it to how you want it to be. It's all or nothing, and it produces hypocrites every single time. And isn't that the whole point? The law kills, it points out sin, it points out lying, it points out hypocrisy, so that eventually coming to, to understand grace and preaching grace, that's where it's at. That's the solution. We preach and proclaim and share Jesus Christ crucified not our own good works and self-improvement. But these people, they're forbidding things, and then they're engaging in those very things, and it's embarrassing. It's humiliating for any movement to be like that. I mean, you know, we've been talking in this series about some of the stumbling and falling that the major Christian leaders have engaged in. And it's most surprising, for some of us, it's most surprising when their preaching and teaching was so strict, and then they end up falling into such sin, and we go, how could that... And actually, it's because it was so strict. It's because it was so law-based. When we're under law, sin will thrive. When we're under grace, 
sin is dead. Sin will not be your master because you're not under law. You preach law and get ready for the fall. And so he says there's hypocrisy and liars. Here's the specifics. This is where they're going wrong. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. So, again, it's like we have our choice now. Are we going to engage in Catholicism that prohibits marriage for priests? Are we going to engage in uh, some sort of a pseudo-Judaism where we bring in the law and abstain for, from certain foods. Remember, Peter was wrestling with that. He had a dream. God gave him a vision. And what was the vision? All of this food is okay. All of this food you can give thanks for. And yet, uh, even to this very day, there are Christians wrestling with this sort of thing. But I think there's something deeper here. Maybe you've never struggled with, am I allowed to eat to shrimp, a shellfish, pork? Maybe you've never dealt with whether marriage is okay or not. Uh, but do you notice it talks about gratefully sharing in this? Um, let's talk about a, a mug of beer. Let's talk about a glass of wine for a moment. I think maybe that's uh, applicable to us today because it's interesting. I'm not talking about drinking in excess. I'm not talking about alcoholism or addiction, which is unhealthy that we need to stay away from if we have a problem. But uh, do you give thanks to God for that uh, glass of beer that you drink? Do you give thanks to God for that glass of wine that you enjoy? Can you give thanks in your heart? If you can't, then why are you drinking it? How about giving thanks for it? And see, that's what he's saying. He's pushing them to the limit of saying, can you give thanks for this to God? Because God made it. It's okay to drink it or eat it. And you can give thanks for it. And if you can't give thanks for it, then is it sin? I mean, in other words, why can't you? So it's an interesting uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in. I've been saying all series long, there's a lot of things in the Bible belt that aren't in the Bible. And, <laughs> you know, in the Bible belt, there's a lot of prohibition of alcohol. And we saw how that went. It was called prohibition of alcohol. We tried that as a nation. And what happened was the black market rose to the highest levels ever, people were doing their deals out in the Atlantic Ocean outside of uh, national boundaries. They were going to Canada to get their beer and wine and sneaking it in and probably drinking more than ever uh, when it was prohibited. And so you say, well, is that the answer? No, apparently the answer is, Lord Jesus Christ, I am thankful for this glass of wine. I'm thankful for this beer. Thank you for this meal, too. You say, wait, what? You can't say give thanks for beer in church. <laughs> you can't do that. Was Jesus thankful for wine at the Last Supper? Was Jesus thankful for wine when he made the best wine they had ever had at a wedding? Um, am I wrong about this? I would challenge you to think it over because... Ultimately, again, we're not talking about addiction. We're not talking about something unhealthy. If that's the case, stay away from it. But we're going to see that you actually sanctify food and drink. You sanctify food and drink by giving thanks to God for it. So that's interesting. It's going to be fun to talk about this. Here it is, verse 4. Everything created by God is good and nothing... Wait a minute. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. Wow. All right. So apparently there's a ton of freedom in the Christian life. And instead of rejecting marriage, I should give thanks for it. Instead of rejecting wine and beer, I should give thanks for it in moderation. Instead of uh, uh, rejecting certain foods, I should give thanks for them. And apparently... Get this, my giving thanks is an attitude that God longs for in me as I partake. Now, maybe you've done something like bless the food. Did you know that blessing the food before a meal is not in the Bible? You can't bless the food. I bless it. 
No, that is not in the Bible. We're not really intended to bless the food. There is nothing passing from your lips over the food that makes it blessed food or magical food. What we see instead is giving thanks for the food. And so that's why I often advocate, how about you wait till you see how it tastes and then give thanks, <laughs> give thanks at the end, right? But no, the scriptural approach, what Jesus did, what the early church did, they were giving thanks for the food, not trying to bless the food or transmit a blessing to it. In fact, uh, if you look up food and blessing, really, Deuteronomy 8 to verse 10 is the closest thing you'll find to that blessing idea. It says that they're eating and drinking and they bless the Lord. They say, uh, all blessing be to the Lord, not to the food. We can't transmit anything to food. So the big takeaway here is that there's incredible freedom, incredible freedom in the Christian life, and that is supposed to cause a thankfulness that wells up within us. And also, there's no contradiction of conscience. See, it's one thing if we're preaching against alcohol and then secretly drinking alcohol. See, that's a searing of your conscience. That makes you a hypocrite. Uh, if you're preaching against alcohol and then drinking it, that's hypocrisy. That makes you a liar. And so Paul is saying, let's do the opposite. Let's not do what so many have done in the Bible Belt as they throw their coat over their shopping cart when they see the preacher. <laughs> right? Let's not do that. Let's go ahead and, and give thanks and drink in moderation and do not be drunk with wine. And if it's unhealthy for you, skip it all together. But all food and all drink, we can say, God, if this is from you, I'm grateful for it and I receive it with gratitude. Amen? That was fairly weak, but we'll go with it. <laughs> You're still wrestling, I understand. See, here's the thing though. You're drinking anyway. You're drinking anyway. I'm just inviting you to give thanks, and that's what you're wrestling with. So are you going to drink with a seared conscience, or are you going to drink with thankfulness to God? Now, if you're underaged, don't drink. It's not healthy for you. You need uh, guidance and time and maturity. If you have an addiction to alcohol, stay away from it altogether. Not worth it. But if you're drinking and yet not giving thanks for it, Paul is saying, give thanks for food and drink. It's from the Lord. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Now, can it get any clearer than that? It is sanctified. Do you know what sanctified means? It's set apart. When they were at the Lord's Supper, they gave thanks. They were grateful for the cup and the, and the bread and all that it represented. And they, they, it was set apart. And anything that we do in faith that is of God, that God created, we can give thanks for it. And it's set apart. We use this word sanctified all the time and we misuse it. We make it about growth and how much we're learning and how we're performing and am I sanctified enough because look at all my performance. Well, here, that definition's not going to work for you. <laughs> sanctified just means set apart. The food and drink are set apart by means of the Word of God and prayer. Somebody says, Word of God, does that mean the Bible? No, it means the instruction of the Lord, the very instruction that He's giving here. He has said that it's set apart. And when we pray and give thanks for it, all the more we are entering into God's attitude about food and drink. You and I, we're not the only ones to wrestle with this. I mean, as I said, Peter wrestled with the whole thing. Peter was a devout Jew. And he sees Paul taking the gospel to Gentiles. And he's like, are you kidding me? Those people... Those people who grew up with tribal religions in their ancestry, those dirty, rotten Greeks, those Gentiles, are you kidding me? And so he wrestled with whether people were clean. And then he wrestled with whether food was clean. And we today, we're wrestling with whether food and drink is clean. It is sanctified by means of the Word of God and prayer. So... This applies to marriage as well. Uh, I remember as a young man, I was uh, 18 years old. I was convinced that I would never get married because it was, I thought it was more spiritual to be like Paul and be single and never be married. 
And so then when I met Catherine, I liked Catherine, but I wanted to be spiritual. But I liked Catherine, but I wanted to be super spiritual. And it was a thing for me. And eventually I told her, I said, I'll be at the altar for that wedding, but I may be in a stretcher. Because, I mean, it was eating at me. God, am I falling off a precipice? Is this going to be less spiritual? you got to remember my past. I was ready to be a street evangelist. I was on the streets of Greece and Italy and halfway houses, jails, prisons, dedicated, committed. I wanted to be on the streets like early church. And then there's this woman. And she wants me to come home at night and we need a picket fence maybe and maybe we should have three meals a day, I don't know. And, you know, is this spiritual? And so it was a conflict of the spiritual and the physical and they were opposed to each other in my young teenage mind. And then this sort of thankfulness entered in and I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, each man has his own gift from God God created man and woman. It is not good for man to be alone. And on and on. And quite frankly, I don't know if any of my ministry would exist without my wife. She's been an incredible help to me. An editor of my books and an incredible encourager for the last two decades. So do you see how Satan wants us to have the physical be opposed to the spiritual? And isn't it interesting that the enemy is not physical. They long to look into what we enjoy. Uh, They're jealous of our physicality. And then they attack our physicality. They tell you that sex is sinful. They tell you that marriage is lesser or bad. They tell you that foods are evil and drink is no good. And then God comes along and says, wait a minute, who is your creator God? What I say goes, he would say. I am the creator God who created all these things. They are sanctified by his word and prayer. Amen? Amen. And pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So I want you to notice that ministry here apparently is about freeing people. (laughs) Paul is saying, hey, I I want you to point these things out. Well, what are they? I want you to shout from the rooftops that you can eat and you can drink and you can get married and you can have relations and you can give thanks to God and you don't need to see the physical as opposed to the spiritual. In fact, they're intertwined perfectly and God made it all and go for it and it's set apart and be thankful and yay God, thank you God. And point these things out because this is healthy church. And this is healthy Christianity. So in pointing these things out, you'll be a good servant. I know what we normally think of, a servant of the Lord, is someone who's telling people, behave really good, right? Do good things, do more good than evil, stay away from bad, do good. And in a sense, that's the message. But really the message here that he's pointing out is, watch out for foolish doctrines that make you look more spiritual when really you're not. Watch out for legalism. Watch out for mixing law and grace. Watch out for tantalizing distractions. Watch out for things that make the physical and the spiritual opposed to each other. Man, they look so religious. They're just not true. The truth will set you free. And we want you in sound doctrine. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. No offense, right? Juana, you're 94 today. Happy birthday. (laughs) On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So I want to talk about two things here. I mean, first of all, you got to see what are the fables. That's pretty obvious. What are these worldly fables? Well, you know, really this is talking about worldly ideas, worldly stories, worldly doctrines. It goes back to the Gnosticism. Have nothing to do with rejection of the body. Remember, what does God say about your body? He says it's holy and acceptable to Him, right? So there are people that I know that when we get a hold of this message and we start talking about the spirit and the flesh and the spirit and the flesh, they interpret the flesh as the body, and then they start thinking, I better not, I better not listen to anything related to the body. 
and they start rejecting the body. But did you know that when the Bible talks about walking according to the flesh, it's not talking about the idea of of listening to your body. It's talking about worldly ways to think and act, worldly philosophies, getting your reputation from your lineage, your heritage, getting your worth and value from your accomplishments and your obedience. Uh, That's what it's talking about. The Scripture never tells us to reject our physicality or to try to walk away from it. It says the opposite. Your body is holy and acceptable. And it says that offering your body to God is our reasonable act of worship. We have a great time Sunday morning as Josh leads us in songs, and that's worship. But offering your body every second of every day, that's worship. And your body is an acceptable living. Notice it says living sacrifice, not dead sacrifice. Your body is a living sacrifice to God. And so he also says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And I guess if I were reading this all by itself, I might get kind of freaked out. I think about Paul, I beat my body and I make it my slave. And here he says, discipline yourself. Well, in context, where does godliness come from? This godliness comes from thankfulness. And this thankfulness comes from freedom. And recognizing the freedom resulting in thankfulness, which is godliness. And rejection of the physical, which results in no thankfulness, that is ungodliness. I mean, that's the context here. Look, I'm all for great behavior, um, a character that is a display of Jesus. I'm all for that. We love that. But in context here, this kind of godliness is, please don't run around rejecting marriage. Please don't run around rejecting food and drink. Please don't run around with a fake religiosity. Don't run around with a pseudo-spirituality. Discipline yourself for the purpose of displaying the true godliness, which involves freedom and joy and thankfulness. This is not stuffy religion. The purpose of this chapter is to free people. Bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I think of our care pastor, Brad Newton, who has the physique of a Greek god. (laughs) And you look at him and you say, bodily discipline is of little profit. And yet it is of profit. It's useful. You say, that's a, that's a healthy man right there. You talk about healthy church. That's a healthy man. And then there's me. No. <laughs> but seriously, bodily discipline is worth something, he's saying. It's worth something. But then godliness is worth everything. So Why is that? It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So there's benefits to physical health here, but there's benefits here and there to godliness. It's profitable for all things. I want to talk just a minute about what that looks like. I'm not sure that I can convey this, but let me just say that Jesus is compatible with everything As I display Jesus, it helps me at work. It helps me because I want to freak out at the coworker who's lazy or the coworker who um, is in a dispute with me constantly or the coworker who. It helps me at work. It helps me at home when you've got kids running around and things aren't going exactly the way you planned that day and you're getting about 10% of what you wanted to get done, you're getting that done. Godliness helps because godliness is God and godliness is Jesus. And Jesus, the life of Jesus in you, the life of Jesus in you is compatible with every moment and everything. That's what he's saying. Jesus took up residence inside of you so that he could be in you and through you at work, At home, in your hobbies, in your interests, Jesus is a perfect fit for everything that you engage in. Godliness is profitable for all things. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Well, what's the statement? Here it is. For it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior 
of all men, especially of believers. Now, this, this verse, quite candidly, has been twisted. You talk about twisted scripture. I mean, this verse has been used to say, well, look, everybody's saved. I mean, Jesus is the Savior of all men. So therefore, the whole world is saved. But you'll notice that Paul follows it up with especially of believers. And as you look at the writings of Paul, we see again and again, God wants nobody to perish, but some will perish. God wants all to believe, but some won't believe. And you got to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So this is a very, in my view, it's a very obvious statement. What Paul is saying is salvation is offered to all of humanity and it is especially beneficial to those who respond to the gospel and believe. We can't carve out a doctrine from half a sentence. And I've seen people do that. They've carved out a doctrine from half a sentence. To say that Jesus is going to save all people, whether they like it or not, whether they receive Him or reject Him, that is nonsense. There is a warning in Scripture today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart, because if you do, then you become an enemy of God. You remain under God's wrath. Let's not carve out doctrines from half a sentence. As we look at the whole of Scripture, this is clear. God's heart is for all people. And yet some reject him, and they're not saved. Verse 11, prescribe and teach these things. Man, when you got something good, share it, right? Share it, get it out. How do we do that? Well, we do it together through online uh, ministry, through person-to-person ministry, through books, through radio, through website, through all of that stuff. You do it face-to-face. With people in your circle. He's saying if you got something good, if you're eating good food, tell people about it. You know there's a great restaurant. It's a new restaurant in Lubbock. And uh, I've been there three times now in a week. Don't tell anybody. It's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> but it's called Moto Medi. Have you tried Moto Medi? It's Medi- yeah, you have, haven't you? It's Mediterranean food. It could be one of our first Mediterranean restaurants. Get the meatballs. Try that red tomato dipping sauce for the flatbread. Oh, my goodness. Shove it up your nose good. (laughs) I'm giving thanks to God for that. But when you got something good, I did a funeral in uh, Amarillo last night. And on the way back, Thomas Kennedy was driving back, and I was driving back in another car. And I'm starting to think, should I go to Moto Medi for the fourth time? And then I'm like, you know, that's everything in moderation, Drew. Come on. But then I texted him. I'm like, best new restaurant to try. And he gets excited. He's like, tell me anytime you find anything new in West Texas to eat. And I mean, when it's natural. When you got something good to say, it just comes out. You want to promote it. You want to talk about it. You want to share it. And that's what Paul is saying. I mean, we got something here. We've got something here. This is healthy church. This is healthy Christianity. This is not hypocrisy or lying. This is physical and spiritual fitting together perfectly. This is giving thanks in all things. This is no fly in the ointment, no worm in the apple. This is healthy, good stuff. So share it. Share it. It's worth telling people about. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Now, that's an interesting phrasing. He doesn't just say, do a bunch of good stuff so people will see the good stuff. He says, show yourself as an example of those who believe. Now, that's what Jesus did. Jesus showed us what it was like to depend. You know, people who say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would walk on water. Have you done that lately? Jesus would feed 5,000. How's that going for you? Jesus would call people snakes. Have you done that? Jesus would kick over furniture in church. Jesus would do a lot of things. Are we asking WWJD, what would Jesus do? Looking back through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or are we asking, how did Jesus depend on his father? How did Jesus look in dependency on him And then now that I have the indwelling Christ, how do I live from Him 
in that same sort of dependency. It's not about the product. It's not about the actions. It's about the dependency. And so he says, show yourself an example of those who do what? Of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhertation and teaching. You know, a lot of places, they, they have a larger budget than we do. They, some places have opted for smoke and colored lights. And I've seen horses coming down the center aisle onto stage and a Harley Davidson, a dude riding a wheelie up on the stage to preach. I mean, you can find it all. You survey planet Earth in terms of church and you can find it all. But remember that it's not about the presentation, it's about the substance. Do you walk away with a public reading of Scripture? Do you walk away with the truth that sets you free? Do you walk away with a new way to think and a new way to act and a new way to depend? That's what matters most. It's cool to be cool. That's fine. We're not anti-cool, but we're pro-Jesus. Amen? The truth will set us free And when the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. Well, we saw a lot today. I guess the big takeaway is God is good, and He gave you a whole lot of good, and He wants you to be thankful for the good and stop rejecting the good. Don't reject food and drink. Don't reject your own body. Don't reject your spouse. Give thanks in all of that. See that if Jesus is the creator God, then he created all these things. He lives in you. There's no conflict. You have the healthiest belief system on the planet. You are righteous and holy and blameless and fully forgiven and free to enjoy all these things. In fact, God wants you to enjoy them, and He wants you to give thanks to Him for them. And that's incredible. There's nothing bad about this. It's all good stuff. So let's give thanks. Father, we thank You for the beauty of Your Word. Truly, it is of You, God. We couldn't invent it. You leave it to us humans and we invent religion. You leave it to us and we invent rules. You leave it to us and we kill it all with restrictions. We kill it every time trying to construct a a tower of Babel to get up to heaven through our deeds. We kill it with lifeless religion and you gave us life and you gave us freedom. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.